Hi there, my name is Miss Townsend and I love math. Welcome to Math with Townsend. This video is for grade 11 students in MCR3U who are looking for solutions to the practice exam questions. It's video number one where we look at the short answer questions from 1 to 15. Here's the first question. It says evaluate the fraction negative 3 over 5 to the exponent 4 and then express your answer as a fraction. So one way of doing this question is to not remember your exponent laws very well, but to know what exponent 4 means. It means take the base and multiply it by itself four times. So this is what it would look like. And the brackets again tell us that we're multiplying. And from here you would just multiply the way that you multiply fractions. Numerators multiplied together, denominators multiplied together. However, the intention of the question is not that. The intention is to help you remember what the exponent laws tell us to do. So when you have a fraction, so for example, I have the fraction negative 3 over 5, it has exponent 4, and because of the bracket, we know that everything within this fraction gets exponent 4. So separately, the numerator has to be evaluated to exponent 4, and the denominator has to be evaluated to exponent 4. One quick note, you'll notice what I did with the negative sign is I instantly move the negative sign into the numerator. And that's always appropriate and acceptable when you're looking at a fraction. So when the negative sign is out front, you can think of that if you want as negative 1 times 3 over 5. Um, but I prefer to actually take the negative and put it on the numerator, which is where it's appropriate to put it. Um, never attach a negative sign to the denominator. And no, I'm not using any fancy vocabulary when I say that. I'm just trying to help you be prepared. So I'm going to do negative 3 to the exponent 4. So negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3 is 81. 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 is 625. Now I know that this doesn't reduce because 3 is prime, 5 is prime. So there isn't going to be any number here that's reducible. But you can always check it in your calculator. So there's my answer. Next question. Now we need to simplify this expression. So we have the base of negative 7 and the base, so the base is constant. And then it says negative 7 to the 43 times negative 7 to the 52 divided by negative 7 to the 30. And it wants the answer as a single power. So we remember that when the base is a common base, if we multiply, it means add the exponents. And if we divide, it means subtract. So in one step, I could just take out my calculator and evaluate this and get negative 7 to the 65. Um, express this as a quotient of powers. So right now, this is a power expression. So what that means is to remember, like we saw in the first question, that the fraction, the fraction means that each of the numerator and the denominator get the same exponent. So this would be x to the 28, 4 times 7, and y to the 42, 6 times 7. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this video explaining the exponent laws. I'm hoping that this is just to help you remember what they are. This is the power law because the exponent has an exponent. So it's a power of a power, and that's when you multiply. Express 5 to the negative 9 using a positive exponent. So that negative sign doesn't mean negative anything. That negative sign in an exponent actually means that I have 1 over the same expression without the negative sign. So again, another exponent law that you're just supposed to know, and that hopefully makes sense to you, that we needed some sort of communication tool to mean a fraction, and it was decided that this sign would mean a fraction. So now I have the square root sign. This is actually the fifth root of 48. So again, you should hopefully remember that as an exponent, that's what the fifth root looks like. So the square root of 9 would look like this. The cubed root of 8 would look like this, and so on. So now I have to evaluate. So I have a fifth root and then a cube. So you can certainly just do this in your calculator, hopefully, but I'll just do it in my head. So I need the fifth root of negative 32. So I, there's some number that when you multiply it by itself five times, you get 32. 
So that number is 2. I know that 2 to the 5 is 32, and therefore negative 2 to the 5 would be negative 32. So I know that what I have is neg negative 2, and now exponent 3. Well, negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 8. So just using the exponent laws. Uh, what type of function is represented by this? Well, that's an exponential function. Oops. Press the erase button. Exponential. Okay. So don't forget that if I had this, that would be a polynomial function. So in this case, the variable is the base, and that's a polynomial function. When the variable is the exponent, that's an exponential function. See the y-intercept of the graph of this? So uh, hopefully in your math class, you've graphed exponential functions an awful lot. Just in case, let's think about what would happen if I start it with some x values and here's some y values. So negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. This is the classic towns and table of values. So negative 2, um, if I sub negative 2 in for x, then that would actually give me positive 5 or 5 as the base. So this would be 25, this would be 5, this would be 1, this would be 1 fifth, and this would be 1 25th. So again, hopefully, you don't need to do this. Hopefully you know this from your, you know, adventures in math class, that we have an exponential function. Oops. It looks like this. Now I just didn't do that very well, but hopefully you can see that there's an asymptote here. Yet there is no value. Like even if I put a hundred in here, I'm gonna get a really small fraction, but I'm definitely not gonna get zero. So the y-intercept, well, again, I just answered a lot of questions that weren't asked. The y-intercept is right here. The y-intercept is at the point 0, 1, because we know that if x is 0, any exponent, if x is 0 as the exponent, then any base, no matter what it is, will give you a result of y equals 1. So we really didn't need a graph, but what the heck. <clears throat> Aha, now here's a good reason. State the equation of the horizontal asymptote of the graph of y equals 9 to the x. Again, I am hoping you have done this graph an awful lot, and you remember things like, well, the y-intercept is always going to be here, because I have a, a base and no transformation. Then, if I go to the 1 position, so if I let x equal 1, I know I have to go up to 9. If I go to negative 1, I know I go to 1 9th, so you end up with the classic shape of the exponential function. Boom. Now, where's the horizontal asymptote? Well, the horizontal asymptote, the value of y that you're going to keep approaching but never get, is right here at 0. So the horizontal asymptote is going to be at y equals 0, and that's because no matter what values you pick for x, you're not going to actually make y equals 0. However, if you pick values like this, or like this, sorry, if you pick values like this, or like this, so values over here on this graph, you're going to get really close to zero, but you're never going to get to zero. That's what a horizontal asymptote is. And, and again, for any graph, any equation of the form y equals base to the x, where base is a real number, um, you're going to get the same answer. The horizontal asymptote is always going to be at zero at y equals 0. Um, state the range. Again, here I have another question where I have a base and there's an exponent. So I have a classic looking exponential function. And again, we've seen this a couple times. It's going to look something like this. So what's the range? Well, it's going to go up to infinity. And this is going to approach 0. Is it ever going to get to 0? No. Is this ever going to get to infinity? No. But they're going to try to get there. So the range, and <clears throat> now this is this is an interesting thing, because every teacher kind of, I've noticed, we write our ranges a little differently. So here's how I would write it. The range is all y such that um, 0 is less than y 
and y is less than infinity. So we're not allowed to actually get to zero, and we're not allowed to get to infinity, but we're allowed to get to any number in between them. And also y has to be a real number, not complex, which don't worry about. We just like to say that because it's good communication. So again, range means the values of y that you're going to see if you graph this, or the values of y that will appear when you substitute the entire domain in for x. And we know just by our experience with exponential functions that we're going to never get below 0 or to 0, and we're going to keep trying to get closer and closer to infinity. State the equation that represents the graph of y equals 2 to the x after it's translated 3 units to the right. So 3 units to the right means a translation to x. So I know that the change is going to occur in the exponent. And 3 units to the right, well, when changes occur inside the function, so in this case in the exponent, they look different. They look opposite. So if I want to go to the right, which normally is adding numbers, we actually have to subtract. So 3 units to the right looks like this. If I had done, for example, this, this would be 3 units down, this would be 3 units up. This is 3 units to the right. Um, all right. State the equation that represents the graph of f at x equals 6 to the x after it's compressed horizontally by a factor of a half. So again, we have a horizontal transformation. Horizontal transformations occur here in the exponent where the x is. And horizontal, tra horizontal translations are the opposite of what we think. So if we want to compress it by a factor of half, well, instead of multiplying by a half, we multiply by 2 because it's the opposite of what we think. So the equation would be f and x equals 6 to the 2x. So again, the change is inside where the x is, and it's the opposite of what we want. We want to multiply by a half, so in fact we show it as a multiply by 2. Next question. Is the graph of y equals 5 to the x increasing or decreasing? Again, think about any exponential function without transformations. They look like this. So on the entire domain, so as you read the graph from negative infinity to positive infinity, that's how you read a graph, this graph clearly is constantly increasing. It's constantly trying to get bigger. So the answer is increasing. Express this in terms of an equivalent equation using base 2. So right now the base is 1 over 8, and we want a base of 2. So first of all, let's talk about the connection between base 2 and base 1 over 8. So we know that 2 to the 3 equals 8, and therefore 2 to the negative 3 is 1 over 8. So there's the connection between the current base and the base we want. So now I can write this as y equals 2 to the negative 3 to the x. So again, I had a base of 1 over 8. I replaced it with the base of 2. Now I'm just going to clean it up. I have a power with a power. And so using the power rule, I get y equals negative 3 to the x. Sorry, <clears throat> y equals 2 to the exponent negative 3x. Watch what I do, not what I say. Sometimes I'm crazy. State the equation of the horizontal asymptote. So here we have a basic function. Then it is moved to the left by 2, and it's moved down 1. So how would this change the horizontal asymptote? So think about, that's a little weird, oh well. Think about an exponential function. If I move it to the left or to the right, does that change my horizontal asymptote? Not at all. So I don't even worry about what that does. But down 1 is definitely going to change my asymptote, because my asymptote is normally here at y equals 0. But now when I move down 1, the asymptote goes with us. So the asymptote is now at y equals negative 1. <clears throat> OK, so that was the first 15 questions. Um, question 16 actually is a bit more involved, so I've already got a 15-minute video. I'm going to stop this video here, um, and um, I'll keep taking up questions in other videos, so I'll see you there.